So in today's class, we are going to learn about piracy. I'm sure you must have heard about piracy and piracy is a crime. It's a maritime crime. That is crime that is when we are talking about the law of the sea, we are talking about uh, the a crime that is committed while the ship is moving in the waters. Now, just for your information, we also call it as armed robbery. I'm repeating, we also call it as armed robbery at sea. But again, there is a thin line of differentiation between the term that is used, uh, that is armed robbery and piracy. As you can see on a screen, you can see the word piracy. So I'm talking of yet another term called armed robbery at sea. Now, basically, piracy is armed robbery at sea. It is like robbery committed at sea. But now, the thin line of differentiation between piracy and armed robbery is that we call it piracy when robbery is uh, carried on where in the international waters but when uh, you know there is a robbery that takes place within the territorial sea or territorial waters of a state or a country for that matter or you call it as internal waters then you call it as armed robbery now, having the set the perspective, let us go through our slides. Now, here we have the meaning of piracy. Now, let's see the connection or the nexus between piracy and United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea. Now, obviously, United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea talks about several provisions relating to law of the sea, and it has to cover maritime crimes as well. A very prominent crime that is committed over the waters is piracy and armed robbery. Again, reiterating, armed robbery, for you to know, I want to drill it into your minds. Armed robbery means robbery that is committed within a nation, the waters of the nation, internal waters. But when there is armed robbery, which is committed in the international waters, beyond the territorial jurisdiction of any state the high seas you call it as piracy as you can see on the screen it says that piracy is a maritime crime that endangers maritime security and the welfare of the vessels sailing on the high sea it simply means robbery on high seas so in legal parlance that is in legal terms piracy can include activities such as robbery kidnapping you know it could uh, one minute please there is any problem okay so let's continue so the area beyond the territorial seas of 12 nautical miles is considered as a high seas and this is what we learned during the last class now coming back to piracy i said that it simply means robbery on the high seas so when robbery is committed on the high seas, we call it piracy. That means when robbery is committed inside the national waters, inside the state waters, what is it called? It is called armed robbery. Now, in legal parlance, piracy can include activities such as robbery, kidnapping, criminal intimidation on board with robbery at gunpoint, etc. What is criminal intimidation? Criminal intimidation means to threaten a person. Say, for example, uh, you know, there are thugs or thieves or terrorists who just, you know, uh, try to attack a sea vessel or a ship at gunpoint. And they intimidate them. They threaten them, saying that if you do not give all your possessions, we are going to shoot you. That's intimidation. That is to threaten people. So piracy includes activities such as robbery, kidnapping, criminal intimidation on board, with a rob or even a robbery at gunpoint. So the area beyond the territorial seas or 12 nautical miles is considered the high seas. When the robbery is committed within the territorial waters, it should be adjudicated as per the domestic laws of the coastal state. So that means if there is a robbery within the uh, you know, territorial waters, 
the laws that are applicable is the domestic laws or the, those particular national laws or laws of that particular state or in the nation. So thereby, piracy is a crime that is committed on the high seas and comes within the ambit of international law. And a pirate may be prosecuted, that is the one who commits the robbery, uh, the pirate may be prosecuted under the international laws or as per laws of the nation to which the pirate belongs or is a national. Now, part 7 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1982, it deals with the offense of piracy under Article 100, 2108 and 110. Now, before we move further, I'd like to gently remind you that this topic is a very important topic and you should be expecting it for your exams. Well, let's move further. So Article 101 defines piracy. So this particular article, that is Article 101, of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea defines piracy as consisting of the following acts. What are they? Any illegal acts of violence or detention or any act of depredation committed for private ends by the crew or the passengers of a private ship or a private aircraft and it's directed where? On the high seas against an another ship or an aircraft or against persons or property on board such ship or aircraft. And it's also uh, defined as to include an activity against a ship, aircraft, person or property in a place outside the jurisdiction of any state. Any act of voluntary participation in the operation of a ship or of an aircraft with knowledge of facts making it a private ship or a pirate ship or an aircraft. And any act of inciting or of int intentionally facilitating an act described in subparagraphs A or B. So Article 100 deals with the duty to cooperate in the repression of piracy. That means all countries, all nations, all states must cooperate to the maximum extent possible. For what? For what? To stop piracy, to fight against piracy. So every state or every country must cooperate in fighting against piracy, in the repression of piracy on the high sea or in any other place outside the jurisdiction of any state. Now, what not to refers to piracy by a warship, government ship, a government aircraft whose crew has mutinied. So in this specific specifically states that the act of piracy as defined in article 101 committed by a warship government ship or a government aircraft whose crew has mutinied and taken control of the ship or aircraft are assimilated to acts committed by a private ship or an aircraft so 103 defines a pirate ship or aircraft now what is a pirate ship or a pirate aircraft so Article 103 gives the definition of it. A ship or an aircraft is considered as a pirate ship or a pirate aircraft if it is intended by the persons in dominant control to be used for the purpose of committing one of the acts referred to in Article 101. So what is 101? Here, the definition of piracy. So committing one of the things as defined in 101 if there is a particular um, pirate ship or an aircraft which where it is intended by persons in dominant control to be used for the activities as mentioned in Article 101, then the same applies that the ship or aircraft has been used to commit any such act so long as it remains under the control of the persons guilty of the act. Now, Article 104 specifies that retention or loss of nationality of a pirate ship or aircraft is to be determined by law. So generally, a ship or an aircraft may retain its nationality even if a private ship or aircraft, uh, you know, like especially when Article 104 clearly states that the retention or loss of nationality is determined by the law of the state from which the nationality was derived. Last class, we learned about that normally ships carry the flag of that particular nation to which that particular ship belongs to. So, and also they carry those, it's important that they carry those relevant documents saying that they belong to a particular country. So sometimes 
a, a, you know, a ship or an aircraft may not have a nationality, may not have relevant do documents, and it might, you know, lose its nationality. And now the 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 uh, ca the factors that may lead to the loss of nationality is determined by the law of the state from which such nationality was derived. Now, 105 deals with the seizure of a pirate ship or aircraft. Like it states that on the high seas or in any other place outside the jurisdiction of any state, every state may seize a pirate ship or aircraft or a ship or aircraft taken by piracy and under the control of pirates and arrest the persons and seize the property on board. The courts of the state which carried out the seizure may decide upon the penalties to be imposed. That means the country uh, or the courts of a particular country uh, who has seized the ship decides upon the penalties to be imposed and may also determine the action to be taken with regard to ships, aircraft or property subject to the rights of third parties and acting in good faith. Next is 106 refers to the liability for seizure without adequate grounds. Now, what happens if um, any country's officials seizes a ship or an aircraft without a valid reason, without a proper cause, without proper justification? So, where the seizure of a ship or aircraft on suspicion of piracy, just based on suspicion, has been effected without adequate grounds, the state or a country making the seizure shall be liable to the state, the nationality of which is possessed by the ship or aircraft for any loss or damage caused by the seizure. Now, Article 107 deals with ships and aircrafts which are entitled to seize on account of piracy. A seizure on account of piracy may be carried out only by warships or military aircraft or other ships or aircraft clearly marked and identifiable as being on government service and authorized to that effect. Now, Article 108 stipulates the cooperation of states in the case of illicit traffic of narcotic drugs or psychotropic substances. Now, all states shall cooperate in the suppression of illicit traffic in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances engaged in by ships in the high seas contrary to international conventions. Now, any state which has reasonable grounds for believing that a ship flying its flag is engaged in illicit or illegal traffic of narcotic drugs or psychotropic substances, that means drugs or psychotropic substances, like it could be anything like it related to drugs, uh, may request the cooperation of other states to suppress such traffic. That means the, the, the state which you know, suspects it can take the help of the surrounding states, or surrounding nations to suppress such a traffic of illicit narcotic drugs or psychotropic substances. Now, under Article 110, right of a visit is not permitted in case of ships engaged in piracy. So next, let's move on to chapter six. So last class we spoke about, I mean, last week rather, we spoke about the demarcations and where the EEZ or exclusive economic zones are situated. We already learned about that. So in this class, we'll go a little bit of uh, bit in detail uh, and study about the exclusive economic zones. Now, what are these exclusive economic zones? You can see the diagram there. An exclusive economic zone or EEZ is an area of the ocean beyond 200 nautical miles of a nation's territorial sea. You can see easily now the same question that Amir Muhammad asked, right? Was it you, Amir? Or was it, yeah, one of you asked me this question. Well, so, yes, yeah, okay, so it was Amir. So here you see uh, the diagram, you can see the territorial sea, 12 nautical miles from a country's coastal baseline. And from there you have 24 nautical miles. You can see the demarcation here very clearly is the contiguous zone. And from the 12 nautical miles from the baseline of the territorial waters, 200 nautical miles is the exclusive economic zone. 
last class we also spoke about exclusive economic zone uh, being a very prominent zone for fishing extraction of uh, minerals mining and so on so as you can see on the slide an exclusive economic zone or eez is an area of the ocean beyond 200 nautical miles of a nation's territorial sea so this diagram will really give you or you know help you in understanding the demarcations it's so clear in this diagram so the coastal nation has jurisdiction over both living and non-living resources of the EEZ. Article 57 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea specifies the breadth of the exclusive economic zone, where it states that the exclusive economic zone shall not extend beyond 200 nautical miles from the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. Just in case we get disconnected, please join back, okay? Next is part five of the convention, article 55 to 75 talks about exclusive economic zone. Article 55 specifically talks about specific legal regime for these EEZs, that is an area beyond and adjacent to the territorial sea, which is subject to the legal regime, which is established in this part of the United Nations convention, under which the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal state the rights and freedoms of the state are governed by and the relevant under the relevant provisions of this particular convention. Article 56, it lays down the rights, jurisdiction and duties of a coastal state in the EEZ. They say that the coastal state in this EEZ has got sovereign rights, he's got full rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving, managing natural resources, uh, whether living or non-living and have access to the seabed, subsoil, extraction of minerals and so on. Jurisdiction as provided for in the relevant provisions of this convention with regard to the establishment and the use of artificial islands, installation structures, marine scientific research, the protection and preservation of marine environment, other rights and duties are provided for in this convention. Next is, in exercising its rights and performing its duties under this convention in the EEZ, the coastal state shall also have due regards to the rights and duties of the other neighboring states, other states surrounding them. So the rights set out here basically talk about the seabed, the subsoil, and that is, you know, uh, 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 that is handled by, or that is adumbrated in part four, uh, and, no, sorry, part six, of you know this particular convention now apart from that it deals with continental shelf as well which we'll go through later now talking about the eez back again article 57 talks about it says that it shall not extend beyond the 200 nautical miles from the baseline from which the territorial sea is measured that means here as you can see in the diagram the eez is exactly from the baseline of the territorial sea to the 200 nautical miles to, to 200 nautical miles and can never be measured beyond that so article 58 basically talks about the rights and duties of other states in the eez so all states whether coastal or landlocked they enjoy subject to the provisions of this convention the freedoms referred to in Article 87 of navigation that is moving around in the waters and overflight that is for flights to move above the waters and of laying of submarine cables, pipelines and other international lawful uses of the sea related to freedoms and those associated with operation of aircrafts, uh, submarine cables and pipelines and compatible with other provisions of this article. Next is article, one minute, I'm just admitting some students. Yeah, so article 88 to 115 talks about the high seas and other pertinent rules of international law that apply to the EEZ insofar as they are not found in this part. So in exercising their rights and performing their duties under this convention, in the EEZ, states have to have due regard to the rights and duties of their neighboring states. 
59 talks about resolving conflicts or disputes that come in terms of rights and the jurisdiction of the EEZ, like who uses the water, who comes and, uh, you know, there is mining done or fishing done in case there are any disputes. Next is Article 60 talks about artificial islands and installations, how the installation should be provided, what are the structures that are allowed, and so on. So that means the coastal state shall have exclusive jurisdiction over such artificial islands, installations, structures, including jurisdictions with regard to customs, fiscal, fiscal that means relating to finance, health, safety, immigration laws, and regulations. Now, when it comes to the question of construction of artificial islands, installation of structures, due notice must be given, okay? And that means they have to give warning that, okay, now there's going to be installations, there's going to be structures. Why? Just to ensure safety of navigation, just to ensure safety of movement of ships, taking into account any generally accepted international standards established in this regard. So I'm sure it makes sense to you that notice must be given to, to you know, the concern about artificial islands being constructed or installed or some structural, structural work is taking place just in the best interest of safety of navigation and so on. And for that, appropriate publicity should also be given with respect to the depth, position, dimension of any installation or structures that are not entirely removed in the best interest of safety. Next is the breadth of the safety zones shall be determined by the coastal state. So they'll normally demarcate that particular safety zones and give necessary notice. So artificial islands, installation structures, and the safety zone around them may not be established where interference may be caused to the use of recognized sea lanes, which are essential to international navigation. But they must see that essential sea routes or sea lanes are not blocked. 61 talks about conservation, protection of living resources in the EEZ. Now, it is the coastal state who shall determine the allowable catch of living resources in its own EEZ. So it takes into account different, uh, you know, sci best scientific evidence that is available, that is to the extent of how much of exploitation or how much of uh, resources can be extracted from a particular EEZ. And then they, uh, you know, try to uh, extract or reasonably exploit the resources within the particular parameters so that they don't end up over exploiting. So they take several measures. Several measures are taken by the coastal state and they take into consideration, like as I said earlier, like uh, that they don't over exploit the resources. Like they use scientific study to find out how, how many or how much of specific species are available how they can help multiply those species of resources, how they can conserve, and so on. 62 talks about provisions relating to utilization of living resources. That means, for example, fish. So how much of fish can be caught? How much of harvest of the living resources can be carried on? So all these parameters are taken care of as well. Now, nationals of other states fishing in the EEZ shall also comply with the conservation measures which are normally given by the state party who owns us that particular coastal zone of exclusive economic zones. So what about fishermen? So licensing of fishermen fishing vessels and equipment, including payment of fees and other forms of remuneration, which in case of developing coastal states may consist of adequate compensation in the field of financing, equipment and technology relating to fishing industry and who takes care of it in the EEZ, the coastal state. Again, the same, like they determine about the, you know, the species which, which may be caught fixing quotas for the catch depending upon the scientific research, study, and so on. They also specify information required for the fishing, uh, fishing vessels, including catch, 
and efforts, uh, statistics, and vessel position reports, and so on. How did, do they do that? They place observers or trainees on board such vessels by the coastal states. Then uh, they lay down certain terms and conditions relating to joint ventures, other cooperative arrangements. They have enforcement procedures and so on. Coastal states shall give due notice of conservation and management laws and regulations. So they root all their efforts towards conservation and management of those natural resources that can be extracted, that can be exploited, but not over exploited so they work within the parameters of the united nations convention of the law of the sea and their own coastal uh, uh, states laws rules and regulations which should not contravene these international uh, provisions that uh, which are adumbrated in the united Nations convention of the law of the sea Article 63 talks about conservation of stocks. Article 64 talks about conservation of highly migratory species. That means like some, you know, there are certain fishes, uh, like for example, uh, say um, salmon, okay? They move towards some other uh, waters. Like we'll see it in this article 66 as well. Let us go one by one. Now article 60, that is interesting to note actually about these highly migratory species where marine animals, you know, for a particular season, they will stay in sweet water, okay, and lay the eggs in salty water. Whereas there are some fishes which will live in salty waters, but prefer to spawn or lay their eggs in the fresh waters. So article 66 deals with conservation of anadromous stocks, for example, salmon fish, okay, and it's fishing in the EEZ. So these type of fishes that we call it as anadromous stocks example is salmon these are the type of fishes which migrate from the salty water that is from the sea to the rivers to the sweet water so okay we were talking about anadromous stocks that is a salmon fish example which prefers to migrate from the salty waters that is sea it moves to the sweet waters to the rivers to lay its eggs that is to breed or spawn so sometimes you know these species sometimes move from the salty waters to the fresh wat waters and those that move from the sweet waters to the salty waters are called as catadromous species okay for example eel this is dealt with in article 67 so Article 71 specifies about the non-applicability of Article 6970 in case of coastal state whose economy is overwhelmingly dependent on the exploitation of living resources of its exclusive economic zones because there are some countries which are highly dependent on these sea resources for their econ economy to flourish. Article 72 lays down restrictions on the transfer of rights that is rights provided under article 69 and 70 cannot be transferred to third states or the nationals by lease or license or by establishing joint ventures or any other manner which has the effect of such transfer unless otherwise agreed by the states concerned. Next is 73 which talks about the enforcement of laws and regulations of coastal state so the coastal state may in exercise of its rights sovereign rights to explore exploit conserve and manage the living resources in the eez take such measures including boarding inspection arrest and judicial proceedings as may be necessary to ensure compliance with the laws and regulations adopted by it in conformity with this convention. What about arrested vessels? Arrested ships or arrested vessels and their crews shall be promptly released upon the posting of reasonable bond or other security. Next is coastal state penalties. There are fines that may be imposed uh, the penalties might include even imprisonment 
depending upon what is the violation. Uh, like, for example, penalties for violation of fisheries laws and regulation in the EEZ may not include imprisonment in the absence of agreement to the contrary by the states concerned or any other form of corporal punishment. That means if there is an agreement, then it might apply. But normally, if there is no agreement, it will not include imprisonment. In case of arrest or detention of a foreign vessel, the coastal state shall promptly notify the flag state through appropriate channels of action taken of any penalties subsequently imposed. That means they contact the, the, the state that owns that particular vessel. 74 talks about delimitation of exclusive economic zone between states with opposite or adjacent coasts. The delimitation of EEZ between states with opposite or adjacent coasts, coasts shall be effected by agreement on the basis of international law as referred to in Article 38 of the Statute of International Court of Justice, that is the ICJ, in order to achieve an equitable solution. In case there is no agreement reached within reasonable time, then what the countries can do, they shall resort to provisions that are found in Part 15 of this particular convention. In case there is an agreement yet to be made, then the states concerned, you know, they operate based on understanding. That is, they have the spirit of understanding and cooperation. And they make every effort that is of practical nature during the transition period not to jeopardize or hamper reaching that final agreement. Where there is an agreement enforced between the states concerned, questions relating to the, to the delimitation of the EEZ shall be determined in accordance with the provisions of that agreement. Next is charts and lists of geographical coordinates. Now, subject to this part, the outer limit lines of the EEZ and the lines of delimitation drawn in accordance with Article 74 shall be shown on charts of scale or scales adequate for ascertaining their position. Now, where appropriate, lists of geographical coordinates or points specifying the geodetic datum may be substituted for outer limit lines or lines of delimitation. The coastal state should give due publicity to such charts or lists of geographical coordinates and shall deposit a copy of each such chart or list with the Secretary General of the United Nations. It means they are expected to deposit the, you know, the boundary lines, the extent of the boundary lines by way of charts, scales, and they have to give the geodetic, uh, clearly specify the geodetic datum, that is the outer limits, the lines of delimitation, what are their boundaries and so on. And in the form of charts and geographical coordinates, they have to deposit it in the office of the Secretary General of the United Nations. So basically, this chapter talks about EEZ and how the coastal uh, states have the right over these EEZs. The basic right that they have is the right to exploit the natural resources, mineral resources, and all other, uh, you know, whether it's even uh, edible resources, or even medicinal resources and whatever resources, exploitation and exploration of the zone, but it should not be overdone. So over exploitation is prohibited. So how would they determine about over exploitation that would be based on the scientific study? What about the vessels that commit offenses? And uh, then how would they, uh, you know, try to take them to task? They would, they would have to conform to the laws of the coastal state. What if there is a particular agreement between the coastal state and the other states uh, and the other state around? Then who is going to uh, you know take action against them? Can you answer this question? The state to uh, the state to which the ship belongs. Okay, so this is EEZ, and in the in the EEZ we also. Uh, I mean, the state parties or, you know, the states or the coastal state can also erect structures, construct artificial islands, have their installations and so on. But then again, they must give due notice 
of such installations that may be carried on in the best interest of safety. Right? Then we also spoke about migratory uh, species such as anadromous stocks and catadromous stocks. Example of anadromous stocks is salmon fish and catadromous stocks is eel. What are anadromous stocks? Example, salmon fish, which moves from the river, uh, sorry, it moves from the sea to the river for the purpose of breeding or spawning or laying eggs. But when you talk about eel, that is catadromous stocks, it moves from where? From the sweet waters, but it prefers the sea. It goes to the sea for, for breeding, spawning, laying eggs. Okay. So this is all about, I was talking about arrested vessels. Okay. And I said, who takes action in case of arrest or detention of a foreign vessel? It is the coastal state should again promptly notify to whom? To the flag state. Who is the flag state? To whom the vessel belongs to. So this is EEZ. On this mostly you will have, um, say, a short note for your exam. Do you have any questions?